One, two, three. Welcome to Skelta. My name is Joe Austin. Can I remind you, Skelta is a joint production of Falcha Fierce to Hear and Fail and Fubble. And can I thank the Connolly Centre for facilitating uh, the interviews that Skelta carries out. Uh, tonight we want to do a very special Skelta. All of us would have watched the unfolding of this war in Ukraine, the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And many of us will have scratched their heads thinking that those wars, the European wars, are gone and they're over. Unfortunately, that is not the case. To try and make some sense out of what's happening, to try and separate the facts from the propaganda or the misinformation, I've been joined this evening by Alexander Titov, who is a, a, a lecturer at Queen's University, and he lectures in European and Russian foreign policy. He's originally from St. Petersburg and has lived in Belfast for 10 years. And if anybody can give us an insight into that, to this conflict, he's the person. So thank you for your time. I appreciate that you've been asked for interview after interview and you're trying to cover all of this. For many of us, myself included, this war has came as a surprise. I, I would have predicted, given even the build-up to it and the, the news reports in advance of it, I would have predicted that this war wasn't going to happen and I got it completely wrong. Were you as surprised as I may have been? I'm afraid I was too, yes. And uh, I was uh, in Russia in early, early January this year. I talked to so many people there about it, all from different walks of life and some people kind of connected with politics and so forth. Nobody believed it. Uh, nobody believed it for all sorts of reasons, not least because of the obvious costs, consequences, and the whole uh, uncertainty that would uh, this this war would create, with absolutely um, kind of uncertain uh, gains which Russia might get out of it. So if you look, if you take out all the kind of moral considerations, which are hugely important and so forth, you know, just on a purely practical level, it it was just mind-boggling that anybody would do it. So I never believed it until about three days before the war. Uh, when the Putin made uh, a special speech uh, recognizing the two breakaway republics in eastern Ukraine, which were at war uh, with Ukraine for about eight years, since 2014, and he made a speech which was much more than just recognition of those two republics. It really was about um, uh, his broader relations with Ukraine um, uh, and also relations with NATO in the West. And I understood that well, this is uh, really is uh, kind of almost ideological basis for much larger uh, conflict. And that's, you know, since Monday I became extremely worried. And then on Thursday last week, of course, a uh, whole hell broke loose. I think many of us have been hypnotized by the television and the, the physical reports of the cost of conflict. Hundreds have died, both Russians and Ukrainians. There have been in-depth analysis as to why that's happened. There have been excellent interviews given by yourself, I have to say, and you must be running from one television radio station to the next. So again, I want to thank you for being with us. Can we dispel some of the myths that are that are been promoted by the less informed stations? For instance, is Putin mad? Is he, is he going crazy? Well, uh, I mean, what we were talking about today, uh, earlier just now, in a sense that uh, the calculation, sort of rational calculation about the costs of the war uh, just didn't stack up, right? You know, so uh, I, I can see why people think that it's just meant to uh, to go with. I don't think it's his meant or irrational. Uh, I think it's just his calculations are simply different from what we assume they are. Uh, and I'm still trying to understand the exact what the calculations are. Um, what I would say is that, as uh, you know, he's made two big speeches in the last week, um, ju uh, basically justifying the war, or uh, they don't call it the war, of course, they call it a military operation. But mm. basically, yes, we uh, justifying the uh, the conflict. Uh, uh, the one is issue, and they are kind of interrelated, uh, uh, but still in a sense separate. So first of all, you have to understand, so from Putin's point of view, that this is not. Uh, a, a new conflict. It's a, it's a conflict which has been going on for eight years. So since 2014, there was, when there was a, 
uh, what is now known as revolution, Euro, Euro Maidan uh, mm -hmm. in, in Kiev, when there was uh, Viktor Yanukovych, the Ukrainian president, was which was overthrown at the time. Uh, he was um, um, coming from Donbas. Yeah, yeah, himself, one of the breakaway regions. The yeah. breakaway, the yeah. breakaway regions. He was Russian speaker. He had more kind of pro-Russian foreign policy in Ukraine. So Russia was very upset about that. There was a local big turmoil, uh, not least because this was the first time during the Euro uh, protest when actually uh, people got killed them. Then, right? So there was the first victims in Kiev. And, uh, and also, so there you have um, uh, breaking out of uh, uh, disturbances also in, um, uh, in the south of Ukraine, in, in the east, in Crimea, and of course that's we have a context of Crimea being annexed by, by, by Russia, but also uh, the, these two breakaway republics, uh, again with, with Russian help, with Russian assistance, uh, begin, beginning um, the um, armed rebellion there, uh, which eventually came to a stalemate, right? In, uh, so it started in March, so in September 14, there was a stalemate uh, when Russian troops interfered, intervened at the last moment and saved those republics. Yeah. Um, then there was, uh, they signed a one Minsk agreement about how to end this conflict. Uh, then they, they, there was another breakout in, um, actually exactly seven years ago in, Ma in May 15, the same second agreement in Minsk, capital of Belarus, with uh, Germany and France as being uh, mediators and, uh, of, of, of those deals, which essentially meant that uh, there was a clear path to settling those. Uh, yes, peaceful coexistence. Peaceful coexistence, essentially reintegration of these two separatist republics, which um, <clears throat> uh, would re-enjoy Ukraine, but with a special autonomous status, with special rights and so forth. Uh, and that basically never happened. Um, uh, so that uh, the Minsk uh, deal was never implemented and uh, eventually we got to the stage okay. where it was repudiated by Russia. In your opinion, uh, why was it not implemented? Was there bad faith? Was it, was it beyond the possibilities or were, did people just break agreements? Well, you see, those agreements were signed when Ukrainian military was suffering huge defeats, right? So it was a matter of them to stop being um, defeated on the battleground, right? So um, uh, they were really never happy with that. Uh, and um, essentially why they were not happy with that um, was because uh, since uh, 2014 revolution you have you know, quite a big change in, inside Ukraine. Uh, so Ukraine always been since the post-Soviet uh, you know, time, since independence, um, there is kind of two broadly balanced half. Uh, you know, we're not reducing them for pro-Russian, anti-Russian, yeah, anything yeah, like that. Yeah. But you know, but there were two kind of uh, the different attitudes towards um, issues of language, issues of history, issues of foreign policy orientation, whether it should be kind of pro-Western, pro-Russian, and so forth. Uh, so they are broadly were balanced out um, uh, with the annexation of Crimea, with the two separatist republics. Th those are the most pro-Russian parts being basically be fall uh, falling away. You have much more consolidated. Uh, kind of Ukrainian national uh, uh, consensus in uh, in Ukraine emerging, uh, which really sort of try to create this Ukrainian nation uh, based more on, uh, I guess, ethnic Ukrainian issues, so uh, issues of uh, language, Ukrainian language, although there was a lot of uh, Russophone people in still in Ukraine, issues of uh, history, so promoting, for example, um, emphasis on history, which um, um, kind of fasted uh, people who uh, tend to sort of struggle against the Russian domination. So Ukraine obviously has extremely uh, complex history and so forth. Anyway, uh, and, and so forth. And of course, very kind of um, orientation towards joining uh, European Union, uh, but also NATO. Yeah? So they passed kind of this uh, constitution. So Russian, uh, so they didn't really want to have this uh, pro-Russian enclave, which would be basically be a rallying point for all the things which were they were trying to uh, get away from, right? And Russia, for the same reason, was trying to push it through. Yeah, trying to keep it. Yeah, yeah. so that, that there would be this kind of pro-Russian enclave which would they could kind of control Ukraine from within, right? So, uh, so there was kind of this uh, failure of interpretation of Minsk. Ukraine basically wanted, like, hey, you, we get control of the border and then we'll talk. 
you know, the Russia says, no, first you do the uh, guarantee of autonomy and then we, with, we give you the border back. So basically uh, for Ukraine and Russia, there were kind of this uh, stalemate and domestically for any president, the, 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 the interesting point here is that when this, uh, current President Zelensky was elected in 2019, in March 2015, he was this um, um, kind of candidate, unity candidate, so trying to kind of bring all the, uh, the parts together, uh, the Russian command and then very kind of more nationalist rhetoric, you know, he was talking language, army and faith, so trying to create a different church, trying to um, uh, promote just the Ukrainian language, rebuild the army against Russia and so forth. So Zelensky was kind of counter this. But uh, basically kind of it became clear to him uh, that uh, domestically it was impossible to implement Minsk agreements because he would be accused of treason yeah. by, by the, um, by the uh, pro, pro kind of patriotic or nationalist uh, uh, groups in, uh, in, in Ukraine uh, and they stalled like before uh, and basically it was continuing with the same policy as before. So that's, um, I, I don't know if, I mean, if, if it's time to look at it now or not but basically I think Failure to implement Minsk agreement was certainly a very much big con contributing factor to the outgoing things. Because for, for so, so going back to the kind of irrationality or madness of Putin, uh, this basically war. I mean, and it, you can see from his rhetoric and from kind of things he mentioning about a death, a massacre, and so forth. I know. That, so that for him, it's basically a continuation of what was happening, and basically his kind of unfinished business from 2014, right? So, uh, so he is still kind of fighting that old war on one thing. So that's one aspect, the Minsk agreement. You know, the issue, of course, of of Ukraine uh, is another one, very complex issue of kind of relations between. Uh, Russia and Ukraine, it's like relations between, you know, Britain and Ireland, you know, extremely c complicated, you know, you have so many different interpretations, you have so many different people, uh, you know, kind of, if you look at the um, the negotiation team now, which they meet uh, yeah, uh, yeah, three yeah. times, you know, the head of the negotiating team is Medinsky, he's born in Ukraine, on the Russian side, he's born in Ukraine, right? Uh, and he was Ministry of Culture and kind of very kind of uh, Russian, um, um, <clears throat> you can say nationalist. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the guy on the uh, opposite side, he is uh, actually Georgian, born in Russia, and then migrated to Ukraine. It's extremely fixed. It's, you know, you know sitting in the Connelly Center, it just reminded me how people move around, you know, the, the language is very, um, it's basically the same. Everybody kind of more or less speaks Russian in, in Ukraine. You know, there's a huge migration. There are lots of ties and so forth. Uh, very kind of um, interlinked history. Uh, and uh, it's, yeah, it's an extremely um, a difficult situation. In it's a complex context. situation. And I think one of the disservices that's happening at the moment is that the media, however you see them, are they they have a very simplistic presentation so so putin is mad and the russians want war you recently have returned from 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 russia and you were in moscow and you were in st petersburg how will russian people view this emergency as it's called or the war how, how will they look at it and what knowledge will they have of it Yes, that's a very good uh, question. Well, of course, I was there before the war started, yeah, right? Yeah. And I, you know, everybody I was talking to, they never thought it would happen, right. just because the, <laughs> the idea of Russia going to war with Ukraine was just seemed crazy at the time. Um, I mean, just two weeks ago, to be honest, you know, um, for vast majority of people, and that's why they don't really want to call it war; they just call it a special military operation, right? So, well, that, that's uh, happened in Ireland many uh, occasions when there was a war and it was called something else, uh, but but effectively, yeah. it's a war. Yeah, well, I think they did want to have it like as, as a special military operation, you know, in a way, over in a week or two, but uh, it's not. Uh, and uh, yeah, so nobody believed it. Now, um, so when it happened, it was a shock uh, and, uh, you know, people still trying to process it. The, um, what people know about it, well, you know, yes, I mean, there, are, there is kind of big... Um, element of uh, state censorship in Russia, uh, particularly on TV. Uh, there are, or at least used to be, many independent outlets as well. Um, uh, and of course, 
you know, Russia has a basically open internet, more, more or less, so you know, you can have uh, <coughs> uh, all information you want, particularly since, you know, there's the lots of stuff coming from Ukraine is actually mm. in Russian anyway. Yeah. Uh, my main medium for getting information about what's going on at the moment is through Telegram, Telegram channels, um, which operate both in Russia and, and in Ukraine, Ukraine. Yeah. and, you know, I have lists of Russian channels or of, of, of Engl- uh, Ukrainian ones, anybody in Russia can do the same thing, you know. So it's not the point of uh, lack of access, it's be, first of all, uh, it's better of, you know, being interested, choosing your channels, but also, and it, I think that's going to be similar to here, in a sense that people live in their own bubbles, they choose uh, information, what kind of suits their views, and basically try to reinforce their views. So, um, so that's the uh, the key, and of course, I mean, since then there was been been shut some independent uh, radio station, been shut down, and kind of a TV station and so forth. So there is kind of this increasing censorship, uh, but you know, it it really is possible to get whatever information you want. It's not lack of information; it's something else which is a problem in there. Can I ask you? Uh, and, and this is a very simple question, it's a very simplistic question, actually. When we talk about, about the Russian leadership, we talk about it if it is only Putin. Um, but clearly that can't be the case. There must be advisors around Putin, there must be a cabinet around him and all of that. Uh, do they have any influence or do they think the same as Putin or are they picked because their views are like his? In your opinion. Well, yes, I mean, this is a very good question. Um, I think it would depend on what uh, area we're talking about, right? So obviously military area, he talks to military advisors, mm. uh, to the Minister of Defense, the, the head of the um, uh, uh, general staff and so forth. Uh, he has, um, if you think about Russia, essentially you have many different um, groupings within the government. Uh, some of them are Kind of business groupings, you know, with links to oligarchs. Some of them are links to the, uh, you know, official bureaucracy. That bureaucracy is quite diverse. You know, you have kind of uh, fi- um, economic ministries which have one view. They tend to be more kind of uh, pro-Western in many ways. Want to kind of uh, open up Russian economy. They talk. About, they care about the economy. You have kind of the security ministries which are much more, um, you know, tend to be more nationalist and so forth. So I guess it depends on what topics Putin is. Uh, talking to, to, to whom, and his kind of power base was based on this idea of kind of be able to manage and balance all those different groupings within themselves. But, I mean, I think this particular um, decision to, uh, to, to invade uh, was done with a small group. number of group of people kind of specifically relating to, to, to the military. Uh, I, I've tried to follow because I, I'm trying and I'm delighted that we're, we have you here today, but I, Try to follow and strike a balance of information about the conflict and, and what it's about. Uh, and I keep coming across some of the official government statements talking about denazification, uh, that, that some of those elements within Ukraine are in fact fascist. Is there truth to that? Well, it's a good question because basically, again, um, you have in uh, from 2014. Uh, the were far right elements in, in in the Maidan. There's no doubt. I mean, they're not the majority, uh, but they were present, and they were sometimes uh, quite uh, important elements because they are kind of the street presence. You yeah. know? Um, I always thought they would kind of fade away after you know things get settled down. But you know, the, in a way, in many ways, they they remain in Ukraine. Um, uh, so kind of, so the war in the east kind of helped to institutionalize them. So you have various. various uh, battalions, either Azov battalion in particular, kind of, mm. kind of, yeah. basically open the net and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I, the I would say they're certainly not in charge of Ukraine by any means, and you have uh, kind of quite a range of parties in, in in Ukraine. Some of them are nationalist right parties. Some of them kind of. Uh, um, you know, we have different views, but what uh, kind of uh, what's happening essentially, so far as uh, Russia is concerned or Putin is concerned, is that there is a kind of broad trend towards 
uh, uh, I have mentioned it earlier, this kind of nation building based on kind of this ethnic Ukrainian um, identity, yeah. which would basically mean that Russia uh, kind of um, um, seeing Ru everything Russian as kind of colonial legacy, right? Um, so uh, that it's which it needs to be get rid of. Uh, so the Russian language is, even though it's sort of spoken by many millions, is this kind of post-colonial um, uh, legacy uh, which needs to reverse be reversed. So, for example, the kind of education in schools which was um, uh, could be in Russian uh, now is in Ukrainian. The uh, Russian in public sphere is. Uh, been um, uh, removed and lined. So, for example, you can, if you can, uh, in newspapers can be in <coughs> has to be done. If uh, if you publish in Russian, you have to publish exactly the same one in, in Ukrainian, uh, which makes it kind of economically unviable. But there are exceptions, for example, for uh, European e EU languages. So you can publish in Hungarian. Yeah, but not in Russian. Right? Uh, so, you know, so, so those things yeah. uh, kind of uh, certainly rattle the um, um, uh, Putin uh, issue of neo Nazis again to come back. You know, they, they're not uh, kind of as influential, but they do they, they, they do have the capacity for mobilization. The, that's not yeah. unique to Ukraine, is it? I mean, mm. these pockets of the far right can be found everywhere, including Ireland. Yes, uh, I mean the, the kind of the. Key the I main difference is that they, they, they've been very vocal on the streets, right? right. Uh, I would say they've been used by many kind of other parties uh, to kind of um, uh, create uh, the right um, you know atmosphere. So you know, for example, when you know Zelensky was trying, you know, thinking about doing the Minsk agreement, you know, there was a lot of um, protests uh, by, by the far right and also in the parliament by the kind of Poroshenko parties and other nationalists. To um, uh, to put pressure on him and so forth. So yeah, I would say they, they, they do have kind of this slightly outsized influence, but by far not. You know, it's certainly not kind of run by by the. And it's a very important point. To, uh, other point to note is that Ukraine has been through two electoral cycles since 2014. Uh, so they had elected one president and a parliament in 2014, and then again in 2019, and. Uh, Zelensky was elected with 75% of the okay. vote. So, uh, you know, and, and his vote was very diverse, and certainly he was elected uh, kind of as opposition to the pro more nationalist Poroshenko votes and so forth. So, this kind of talk is uh, um, um, kind of, to me, it sounds like a kind of echo of uh, 2014, which they, they kind of never got rid of. Ukraine has kind of uh, Develop much, move much further away from that. Although there are kind of issues, of course, with uh, with the far right, but you know they they they're not anywhere near as kind of uh, you know Russians uh, officials saying. You mentioned the oligarchs and those people who have become wealthy in, in Russia, as they became wealthy everywhere. Ukraine as well, for, yeah. for one reason or another, not unique to Russia, by the way, not unique sure. to Russia. The sanctions that we are seeing imposed on an hourly basis. Uh, never been a daily basis and we have all things that are happening I don't know why you got a chance to catch the news today uh, two Russian language films that were been shown in a, a Glasgow film festival have been banned for no reason other than the Russian and uh, one of the people involved in it is uh, an anti-government film director how will these in your opinion how will the sanctions work and if they will if they do work and do they, is there a risk that they actually affect and hurt ordinary Russians, which pushes them in the direction of the government? Yes, this is a very good question. So I guess there's two elements, this kind of self-imposed sanctions by, you know, a few system organizers, and there are kind of systematic sanctions against the Russia, against Russia, Russian state, uh, by the Western governments, or G G7 more broadly. Um, so yeah, I guess there's two separate issues. If we're talking about sanctions, um, economic sanctions, more broader ones, of course they are uh, devastating to Russian economy. There's absolutely no question about it. And despite uh, Russian government since 2014, when they next Crimea, there were some sanctions introduced against Russia. They, they did, did a lot of um, uh, reforms to address those issues, to reduce the exposure to uh, Western, um, Western sanctions. Um, Russia is a very um, 
um, kind of well-integrated world economy. Uh, so of course it would be huge, huge uh, impact. For example, 70% uh, of Russian planes are made by either Boeing or Airbus, and now they. Tell me that figure again. 70%. 70. Percent of Russian airlines fly. I, I, I didn't know that. They fly on Airbus or Boeing or Embraer. Uh, all those planes now been. Uh, ordered to be returned, uh, those which were leased, usually most of the planes are leased rather than bought outright. And even those which were bought outright by the Russian companies, the Boeing Airbus are refusing uh, any service or supply any parts to them. That's what makes them uh, unusable. For example, so that's, and if you think about Russia as a kind of largest country in the world, not having no planes to get around is, 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 is yeah, interesting, you know, just like, it's, it's really a major blow. Um, uh, but of course, you know, it's not just that, you know, you have also not just switching off Russian banks from international payment, but also um, freezing reserves of the Russian central banks of sovereign money, which were held in corresponding um, banks uh, in the West and Japan uh, have been frozen, which that was really big. That's that's something they didn't really expect because it's it's, it's really is um, a really big step. The really. major step, yeah. It's a major step. It's sort of uh, I mean, <laughs> almost, I mean it's a kind of like a not quite a declaration of war, but you know you see it's a property. Somebody's kind of key property. You know, uh, mm. it's it's a, it's a big deal. Anyway, so uh, so that's kind of meant that Russia couldn't use all its reserves, which is built up. The inflation is shooting up. The interest rates are going up. Uh, the people can't buy things from abroad. Uh, you have also, of course, airspace completely close to the Russian planes. Um, uh, companies, Western companies, are leaving Russia in droves. So Volkswagen, Mercedes, uh, closing their factories which they had in Russia. Uh, so people will be losing jobs there. Um, and of course, um, a lot of people, what coming back to the issue of a festival, you know, they kind of also boycotting Russian goods, right? So we took, I think, uh, uh, well, I don't know, uh, banning Russian vodka and <laughs> whatnot <laughs> from shelves and so forth and so forth. So all those things are, um, you know, happening, and this is a huge, huge blow to Russia. I mean, it's, 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 it's. I don't know if how much they, they can recover. I'm just going to ask you uh, and your opinion, and it's all about opinions. I know that you, you. you you're an observer, and your your background is, is Russian studies. But are these measures likely to? I mean, obviously, before the war began, these calculations must have been taken by by the Russian leadership that this was maybe not as severe as it has happened, but there must have been a likelihood. Ordinary people don't have a choice. You mentioned the workers who will lose their job. Over a conflict of no pardon, they didn't. They weren't consulted. Are these liable, Are these likely to force Russian opinion back to the period of the Cold War, or are they likely to lead to opposition to the government? That's a key question, and um, we don't know yet. Okay. Um, it's it can go both ways. Uh, the problem here is that. Um, uh, the way it's being framed, and you know, not even necessarily, certainly by the government, but it's almost like a natural reaction. And I've seen it. I mean, I spoke to a few people about that, and that's the, what they they saying is basically like a, a you know, um, the West declaring war about Russia. And you know, something I didn't mention in the um, when we talked about Ukraine and Donbas conflict. You know, there was kind of three elements: of the conflict against Donbas, the um, kind of Ukrainian uh, internal politics. Um, uh, it was Russian uh, uh, speaking population, but also the third one was, of course, relations with NATO and European Union, right? So basically, with this conflict, is issue uh, of uh, a kind of West declaring war on Russia, right? You know, they want kind of to subjugate. And I think it's true in a sense that, you know, I think these sanctions, because they're coming so fast and then such a huge, game, they really are designed to cripple Russian economy. Uh, uh, cause a huge economic uh, um, uh, problem, if not collapse, and also, uh, I think, ultimately, even if it's not open and stated, I th sometimes it's open and stated as well, uh, regime change in Russia. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I think that, you know, and, uh, uh, the 
population response can be uh, different. You know, you can blame Putin for this, which is obviously, you know, he started the war. Um, uh, but you can also blame the West as well, you know, if, if you're sitting in Russia and you're losing your jobs when, you know, under those sanctions and so forth, you can have rallying around the flag as well. Uh, which tendency will prevail, I don't know yet. Um, but my kind of gut feeling is that it probably will, uh, uh, Putin will survive and um, they will manage at huge cost and survive these economic sanctions. Well, one of the things that struck me, and I, I, I understand, I might not necessarily agree, but I understand the, the freezing of assets from billionaires and multi-billionaires and so on, large companies and consortiums, but I, I'm not sure I understand the effect of Bonn and Russian athletes or Bonn and you know, Russian ballet dancers, which has, has actually happened in London this weekend. I don't, I don't know where that takes us to. And you talked about in, in one, an article that I that I read that you that you had uh, given that whatever happens in Ukraine, the world is never going to be the same. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I think uh, if you look at the post Cold War period, um, you know. <laughs> Everybody, so, so, so much often cited phrase by, <coughs> excuse me, American um, philosopher Francis Fukuyama, mm. you know, that we had at the end of history, that the, uh, the liberal capitalist democracy have won with the collapse of the Soviet Union. There's no more ideological conflict, you know, it's just a matter of time before everybody, including China and Russia, mm -hmm. will uh, just basically integrate into the West. Uh, Russia has kind of obviously been a difficult case, but you know, economically, it's certainly been integrated into the West. Um, if you look at you know the, the impact the sanctions are having now, the West cutting it off uh, so dramatically. Um, uh, so ideologically, we've seen that you know you have rise obviously of China, of Russia, uh, of Arab world, and so forth, which you know not not. Um, kind of buying into the you know li li lib liberal uh, capitalist democracy uh, of Western style, uh, but also I mean uh, the issue here, and that's already I suppose was happening. Uh, the issue here is also that the economically the world is becoming uh, divided again um, because underlying it all was this kind of idea of globalization as a yeah. kind of, as a global capital as a global uh, finance moving around supply chains uh, completely interlinked you know f f from china to kind of uh, to, to west office and so forth um, uh, this is breaking down um, uh, you can't uh, you see that the, um, the western countries can just with the one you know signature can uh, you know, switch off a uh, whole country of, yeah, of, from, from a place. So that becomes kind of issue of security, that integration into the world uh, economy is uh, um, a, a, a being securitized by, by kind of thinking about Russia, of course, but China as well, you know. How, you know. So what we will see is that fr I think will be a fr fracturing of the world further on, you know, so the um, uh, dependency on uh, kind of global finance and dollar in particular uh, will probably be, be uh, uh, tend to reduce and so forth. So greater interdependency and you know, there's also this issue of, you know, if you is so much, so economically, economic interdependence would also kind of reduce the chance of conflict. Now we see that's not the case, yeah. So the economic interdependency is being uh, discarded, people are becoming, or country, some countries are becoming more uh, isolated, uh, the risk of conflict increasing. So I'd say, okay, so there was a 2008 financial crisis which kind of dealt a blow to this kind of uh, version of post-Cold War globalization. I think this is another blow. Uh, and, uh, uh, but of course, as, I mean, from a personal perspective, of course, the issue will not be the same in Russia because it's all the 30 years of uh, its integration with the West development of its economy just been flushed down the toilet uh, in, 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 in an instant like that. It's really scary. I don't know how things will be there now. I asked a friend of mine, um, he's a lecturer like yourself, only he's a lecturer in economics, and I asked him for his view of the economic consequences. And he said something I th that kind of struck and stuck in my head. He said, you know, this was always predictable. If you poke a bear, you'll get a response. And he, he wouldn't be a great defender of, of the current Russian 
regime. But he talked about the provocation around the, the, the consideration of NATO membership, uh, where he said this, this, this was always going to anger the Russian uh, administration. So was there a sense that this could have been prevented? Could, uh, could, could something have intervened between the discussions and the war that could have made this war redundant or not necessary or not happen? Well, I, I always thought that, it's, that they, they, they could have done more, to be honest. Uh, I don't know at what stage, um, when they kind of, maybe not in the weeks running up, or maybe, maybe even them. But, you know, okay, so, you know, if, if you have a kind of two root causes, this issue of um, failure to integrate the, uh, <coughs> implement the Minsk agreement and reintegrate the Donbass on, on Russian terms, let's call it that, uh, <coughs> which were uh, unacceptable domestically for Ukraine. Uh, if they did that, you know, Possibly one cause has gone, and that would be more kind of pro-Russian Ukraine or Russian veto of, uh, for example, membership of NATO as well. If those you know reintegrated autonomy, autonomous were able to uh, veto it and so forth, so that would kind of taken off some pressure on yeah. the yeah. issue. But I think kind of also from NATO perspective, the, the, the tragedy here is that there was no prospect of um, um, uh, Ukrainian membership because we've seen now that as soon as the you know, any threat of real conflict, you know, all the NATO um, countries with, withdrew, you know, there were uh, British and uh, American and Canadian military advisors in Ukraine, they withdrew, they're gone. Uh, they're gone and so forth. And they were kind of explicitly stating, we're not going to fight them. Uh, so if you're not going to fight, of course, you can't have a member because membership implies that you will fight for, for and all defend, the members yeah. and defend. So uh, they just were, ref you know, refusing to um, you know, guarantee non-membership uh, based on kind of high principles, right? Uh, I'm just wondering if, you know, compromise on those high principles yeah, would have saved, would have, would have saved um, uh, the, from the conflict and also sort of issues. So, the, I mean, I, I don't think in, in itself was one thing, but I think it would, be, would have been an important element of um, kind of reducing Russian kind of paranoia about uh, NATO membership, which, which they are extremely um, uh, worried about. You mentioned earlier um, China. Uh, a powerful factor in this conflict, uh, a salient factor at this point in time. Uh, Russia, I suspect, could, would have thought that China would have either vo verbally came to the raid or, or, or maybe made some, some commitment to them. They haven't. Uh, they're, they, they appear to be silent. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Is that a disappointment for the, the Russian administration that China hasn't been more vocal in support of what, China, what Russia has done? I think they would be quite happy with you know, China's stance so far. Do you? Yeah. Uh, well, they, they, all, they abstain uh, on all the key uh, EU votes. Uh, I am kind of obviously looking at the Chinese reaction as well. Uh, Chinese reaction been quite um, kind of consistent with Russian views, you know, saying that you know this is a complex conflict, and uh, you know, quoting almost the Chinese foreign ministry here, you know, the five wave of NATO expansion uh, led to um, you know uh, Russian happiness, and the you know its security should be you know should be should be taken in consideration. So they are kind of talking within the framework that NATO uh, enlargement is a factor in, in current Ukraine yeah. crisis. Okay. So I think Russia would be quite happy with that. Uh, the what they would need now, Russia is actual kind of actual um, economic uh, steps by China in terms of. Um, Helping Russia dealing with the, with the Western sanctions, uh, I think it will come eventually, but um, it will take time, right? Um, so I would imagine that uh, I mean Russia is China's biggest supplier of oil, for example, right? It's bigger than Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's kind of second largest supplier of coal. Uh, you know, it's, it's supplier of gas as well, not as much as oil, of course. But um, uh, so China and China strategically, if you think about Chinese foreign policy, uh, they know that there is a um, tensions and you know confrontation with the West, particularly with the United States. Yeah. You know, it was clearly from Obama years, you know, have uh, pivoted to Asia, but it became very clear under Trump, right, when they have, uh, you have, if you look at the, um, I've been, you know, obviously looking, following the, um, you know, what 
Western politicians saying about Russia, including British politicians. You know, until about, until about 2018, it was all about Russia. Yeah. Uh, now in 18, 19, they, create, they, they kind of shifted towards China. You know, you have become, like it was become much more acute. You know, you have China Research Group, for example, mm -hmm. created in British Parliament, the Conservative Party, mm -hmm. Extr very, very, you know, um, you know, uh, well, you know, f f from Chinese point of view, it would be very anti-Chinese. Right? Yeah, very reactionary. Um, yeah, so uh, they, you know, so there was, you know, you have banning of Huawei uh, equipment, uh, you have kind of uh, limits on Chinese cooperation with Chinese universities and so forth and so forth. So basically you have this <coughs> rhetoric for the two years um, of you know, extreme anti-Chinese um, um, rhetoric, but uh, that's now been overshadowed by Russia. And uh, it's been overshadowed by Russia, um, but China doesn't forget that, of course, right? So, you, you, of course, you have issues of uh, with uh, Xinjiang, Uyghurs, and so forth, you know, but all those things are there, right? Um, uh, for, for, for China, the strategic, uh, having Russia as an no. ally is extremely important. Yeah, of course, yeah. You know, have, yeah. watching each other back. So, I don't think that we'll ever allow Russia to, to, to collapse. So th I think this will be another very long-term consequences, much closer and much uh, speedier uh, consideration of Russia, China, 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 Russian alliance than we would have it otherwise. I've kept the very, the most difficult question to the last. Uh, and uh, this is guesswork because you don't have a magic uh, mirror or, or a, uh, you don't have an insight into the, the future. But in your opinion, what are we likely to see? We're, we're over a week into the war. The horrible war, Ukrainians and Russians stand as a result of this conflict. What are we likely to see in the next number of days? Ceasefires, continuation, total takeover of Ukraine. What's, what's likely to be there? It's a difficult question. So basically Russia's, I don't know, uh, Russian sort of plan seems to have um, been checked to, to an extent by, by Ukrainians, <clears throat> but I think they're still progressing with on some key issues. So on Donbass, they're still fighting in Donbass, so I think there will be no talks until Donbass been, um, the Ukrainian forces been completely uh, clear out of Donbass. I, I, I pray to God that there will be kind of some kind of ceasefire before there is a kind of major assault on Kyiv or, or Kharkov, these very large Ukrainian cities. Um, issue of Odessa as well, I think there will be an attempt to, to, to seize Odessa too. Uh, so, uh, the question here is, you know, at what point they will negotiate. I think, uh, we hope, if there is no negotiation within next, you know, week or 10 days, you know, then we are in here for long term, I'm afraid. So, I hope there will be some negotiations. The key of negotiations, of course, is what, they go, what are they negotiating. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, uh, Russian demands would be recognition of Crimea, recognition of the two breakaway republics, neutral status for Ukraine. I think. Yeah, I would the imagine demilitarized that, Ukraine. Well, that's what they say. I mean, demilitarized Ukraine. I think what they mean is they uh, kind of guarantees that it's sort of there is no major rearmament of Ukraine after the war, uh, and I think probably some um, kind of cultural rights guaranteed for the Russian speakers as well in Ukraine, so kind of a rise language. Very, uh, really unacceptable demands for Ukrainian government. So I don't know if they will ever to agree to that, to be honest. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed mm. for, for a peace that's lasting and that saves all the lives that they're going on. So for being with me, my guest, Alexander Tito, thank you. You've been a wonderful guest. Thank you.